to introduce this session's panelists. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Can everybody hear me? What? Okay, good morning. Um, as, as the MC just said, uh, my name is Adrian Klasa. I am the editor of This is Africa, the Financial Times. And this pa panel is Moving from Agriculture to Agribusiness. So thank you all for being here. Um, I'm going to start by very briefly introducing this topic before we turn to our panel of esteemed experts um, over here beside me. Um, but in terms of why it's important to speak about agriculture in the context of international trade. Um, according to the FAO, one in three workers in the entire world is employed in agriculture. Um, in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, especially, um, about 60% of the workforce works in agriculture. Um, these are often people who are working in subsistence farming. One of the biggest challenges that confronts um, global trade is integrating these small and medium, uh, well, small holder farmers and uh, medium-sized enterprises into global value chains, so that farmers and um, business owners um, can profit and can bring value addition um, to their home countries, as opposed to uh, producing simple commodities that are then exported um, mostly to more developed countries and value and. Um, economic benefit accrues there rather than where these products are being grown. So in order to t speak about why this has proved such, uh, such a challenge um, to actualize and to talk about um, experiences on the ground as well as policies um, that have helped and programs that have helped um, to bring agriculture um, towards the point of being uh, more of an agribusiness, um, I have all my panelists here who I'm going to begin to introduce now. Um, so to my left, um, I have Mr. Perrin Saint-Ange, who is the Associate Vice President for Program Management Department at the International Fund for Agricultural Development. Um, next to him, I have Mr. Edmund F Poku, who is the CEO of Niche Cocoa Industries in, uh, Limited in Ghana. Thank you both for being here. Uh, next to him, I have Mr. Miklos Marotti, uh, founder and CEO of Agrovir um, here in Hungary. Um, I have Mr. Rufat Mamadov, um, president of the Azerbaijan um, Export and Investment Promotion Foundation. Um, next, we have Mr. Ajmal Abdul Samad, who's a research analyst at Duke University. And finally, we have Ms. Dorothy Tembo, who is the Deputy Executive Director of the International Trade Center. Um, so thank you all so much for being here, and I look forward to a lively discussion. And just um, a final housekeeping note before we dive straight into it. Um, for those of you in the audience, I will be leaving 15 to 20 minutes for questions from the floor at the end. Um, please think of challenging and provocative questions to put to our panelists. Um, I know that they, they would they would appreciate your participation, as would I. So, in order to kick off our panel, um, I'm going to turn to Edmund um, from Ghana first. Um, and I think that the, the narrative that we're going to try and draw out here, first of all, is moving from those who are actually working on the ground, who are working with producers, up towards the level of policymakers and I.O. So, Edmund, from your perspective working in Ghana, um, one of the things that Niche Cocoa Industries has been able to do is to work with smallholder farmers to move, um, to, uh, to basically um, foster their ability to do more value creation at home in Ghana as opposed to simply moving cocoa to export um, to other places. So can you talk to us a bit about what you've been doing there and what has been effective? Thank you very much for having me. Um, my name is Edmund Poku. Managing Director for Niche Cocoa. Um, we process cocoa beans to semi-finished products, like products like cocoa butter, cocoa cake, cocoa powder, and we export 100% to the international market, specifically to the US and Europe. We process about 60,000 metric tons of cocoa with a total revenue of about 150 million, making us one of the biggest exporter in Ghana. Over the past three years, we have been the Presidential Exporter of the Year in Ghana. We are ISO 22000 certified. That makes us to be able to produce products to international standard. First, let me tell you a little bit about myself. 
Um, I grew up in Ghana, went to secondary school in Ghana, and I got a scholarship to go to do a dual degree program in the United States. I went to boarding college to study liberal arts and, board, and Columbia University to do in industrial engineering. After that, I worked for PricewaterhouseCoopers doing management consulting. I went back to school to get my master's in engineering at Dartmouth College and my MBA at Columbia Business School. It was at Columbia Business School that I took an elective in entrepreneurship where I developed a business plan to process cocoa beans in Ghana. At the same time that year, I got a, um, an offer from Goldman Sachs to do investment banking. And as we all know, everybody's dream in business school is to go and work in a prestigious investment bank, especially being in New York. So I went to work for Goldman doing investment banking. Then after three years, I decided to go back to Ghana to raise money and start the cocoa processing plant. My professors encouraged me and um, I went to Ghana. I thought with my educational background, my experience in investment banking, knowing how to raise money, I thought it was going to be fairly easy to raise 12 million to start the project. And that was completely wrong. It was a total failure. Most international banks were not willing to look at a developed or a third world country to finance such a project. Our local banks were looking at it that it's a green field that we don't, uh, we don't support manufacturing in Ghana. And at that time, it was only the government and the multinationals that were actually processing cocoa in Ghana. So they were very hesitant to even to think about an individual going into cocoa processing. And also, 12 million was also very big for their balance sheet. So at the end of six, uh, my process in raising money, six months, I packed my, my things and went back to the United States. Luckily, I was able to get my day job back and worked there for two years. But I decided to go back again and make a second attempt and see how it will work. This time around, I was able to go around some of the obstacles by using a government-backed debt to be able to finance the project and with a little equity that I had from the investment banker. Within two years, the project was very successful. We paid off our loans and in four years' time, we sold the company to a French company about five times the multiple of the company. And we used that investment to be able to start the niche cocoa um, processing. Um, to answer your question, um, how did we do that? Basically, we bootstrapped the company, and whereby we used retained earnings from the company to be able to grow slowly. But with the help of the Ghana back debt, that was what made it to be successful. And today, we are one of the biggest processing companies in Ghana. Thank you very much, Edmund. And I'm sure that we'll be able to touch a little bit later on the difficulties um, specifically in crowding and finance to agriculture, because this is an issue, uh, particularly in sub-Saharan Africa, but also internationally, especially um, when you're looking at the lower ends of the value chain. Uh, but now I'm going to move to Miklos, um, who, uh, first of all, if you could give us sort of an overview of what Agrovir does, because Agrovir is a tech company. Um, so if you could give the audience an idea of what exactly your technology does and how that works with smallholder farmers or with farming collectives. Okay. I am an agricultural engineer. I worked for three years in the UK for the biggest agricultural advisory company in the UK, and I worked as a production director here in Hungary for a big farm. And I realized that even we had accountancy system, farm management software, many digital systems, we didn't know our cost and profit on a technology level, on a field level. It is why Agrovir uh, was funded. We are helping to our clients to know the cost. They have more transparency for their business. They can make better decisions from this information. Uh, our my main focus to arable land, but we have clients from vineyard, livestock, orchard as well. And I am very proud to say that we have clients uh, from other countries uh, from this region. Uh, until now, it would be a simple story, but uh, we started to look to work together with two global uh, seed breeder and chemical producer companies, and it took us as a surprise when we realized that 
they don't even know, even the biggest one in the world, what is going on on a field level. What is the yield of the variety? What technology do they choose? Of course, they had trials around the country, around Europe, but they don't really know what's going on on a field level. And it, it was the time when we started to make benchmark and analyze the data and find what is the best management practice for our clients. And uh, in this year, even uh, Agricultural Scientific Institute uh, here in Hungary, owned by the government, uh, started to work together with, with us. And we are collecting data, real farm data, from around the country electronically and sending to this uh, institute to analyze them and research them. But uh, as we say it in a, in a marketing way, for our clients, uh, we change the farming from mysticism to decide by experience to, let's say, atomic science to decide by hard data and hard facts. Very interesting. And I'm sure that has applications outside of Hungary and Central Europe as well, um, where there's always a, there's a lack of data and a lack of concrete information. Uh, it was a surprise for us, but uh, no one, from, from my knowledge, no one else could have this type of data and this detailed of data because the IT didn't reach that level. It was an article from Monsanto, I think, last year that uh, how big data and this data analysis can help to do agricultural. It's starting everywhere in the world right now. Very interesting. Um, I'm going to move to Rufat now um, to, to talk a bit about the experience of Azerbaijan. And particularly, I mean, you're coming um, from the perspective of the National um, Export Promotion Agency. Um, so when most people think about Azerbaijan, especially outside investors, they think about oil. So how do you crowd investors into non-oil sectors and particularly into agriculture? How do you get them excited about it? Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> I just want to give a back background for those who don't know that much about Azerbaijan. 25 years ago, um, approximately 25 years ago, there was no Azerbaijan. There was a Soviet Union, and Azerbaijan was part of it. After the collapse of Soviet Union and regaining of independence, we didn't have any economy, so everything belonged to the state. So basically, we didn't have uh, agriculture in the present sense of the world, uh, world when um, the business own, uh, owner, the private business owner, owns the land and does business and can sell and buy and so on. Um, <clears throat> so we started from the scratch 25 years ago. Today we have the agribusiness industry, which makes, uh, especially agro-processing, which makes about 40% of the total manufacturing output um, in our country. This is actually much more than the uh, production of oil products or petrochemicals. So it's less than extraction of oil, but much more than the production of the um, oil products. So, um, but there were several, let's say, pillars of the policy uh, making or strategy and its implementation in order to achieve certain success in terms of transformation of agriculture into the full-scale agribusiness with the processing component, with the relevant services component, and so on. So first, we started with facilitation. So it's important, be it about investment, attracting foreign or domestic investment, or promoting exports or trade, you start with facilitation. So we um, improved or created from the scratch a business environment, an investment climate that enables private business. Uh, we did a lot of reforms. We privatized the land completely. We, was, we were the first country to privatize completely the land among the population and the farmers. Um, <clears throat> in order to boost the agricultural output, we exempted completely the agriculture from the taxes. To the Azerbaijani agricultural producers, they don't pay any taxes. Um, but in order to um, also make a link between agriculture and agro-processing uh, industry, uh, you have also to stimulate the agro-processing. So basically we introduced an incentive package for the agro-processing. 
exemption, exempting them for seven years from different types of taxes, providing the um, um, other privileges like infrastructure and so on. We um, liberalize the trade regulations. I can give you an example, for instance, of our recent achievements. We introduced a digital trade hub. Actually, that was a discussion for, for the last two days. Um, about uh, facilitating the trade. So we introduced a digital trade hub means that today a farmer or a whatever uh, business person or company um, um, can do international trade basically online. So we have e-customs integrated there, we have all the e-certification, um, uh, e-licensing and whatsoever. Whatever is needed for your export or in general trade um, um, operations you can do online without approaching anybody anywhere from your home or from your office. Um, another important pillar is support. Support the business. Without support of the business you cannot uh, really uh, expect results. So basically we introduce a number of um, financial schemes to um, uh, uh, provide easier access of um, businesses including farmers or agribusinesses to the um, uh, to finance, uh, soft loans, of course, uh, some subsidies. Um, no, no agriculture without subsidies. Uh, we invested a lot in the critical value chain infrastructure, of course, roads, everything, storages. Uh, that's important. For instance, within the last ten years, we have constructed 51 new storages for agricultural production. We, um, you have to address the constraints of the uh, producers have to listen to the producers, you have to work with them, otherwise you don't really go along with the business as the policy maker and, and those who are implemented. And teach, definitely teach, especially in the agriculture, I understand that most of us, uh, especially those from the developing countries or countries in transition, we face the, the, the problem of farmers or the agribusinesses having um, a problem with uh, access to the know-how, to the latest uh, technologies, to the latest knowledge. So teaching is a very important component. Um, so another important pillar is um, unification, or un um, uh, so uh, integration and connection, connectivity. So we started to unify farmers and produce um, uh, agro-processing uh, industry plus the, those who are working in the relevant services under the umbrella of uh, sector specific associations. It was very difficult to, uh, for us to sell to the private business the idea of cooperatives but now we have already established all the necessary legal infrastructure and launched the process of uh, the uh, establishment of um, uh, cooperatives. Uh, we have um, um, integrated um, the whole value chain, uh, so made the linkage between the farmers or the producers of agricultural products, those who are providing services, those who are processing, those who are trading. Um, and the final um, important component in the, the whole policy is the promotion. Without promotion you cannot really go abroad, this is about the exports. So we have very ambitious program, um, incentive program plus um, um, business support mechanisms, 10 business support mechanisms to go abroad to launch exports or to expand your presence on the foreign markets. Uh, we have uh, 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 established the trade houses, but um, uh, we have trade house, Hungarian trade house, but our trade houses are slightly different. They are uh, basically trading companies, Azerbaijani trading companies abroad do trade. Uh, we have logistics centers to facilitate the logistics of our products in foreign countries. For instance, we have a large logistics center in Kazakhstan, one in the United States, and so on. So as a result of this, we have, let's say, of those promotion measures, this year we have achieved very good results in exports of agricultural and agri um, um, uh, foodstuffs. Uh, for instance, um, the exports of vegetables has increased 60% within this year. Uh, we have increased 60, 60. We have increased, for instance, the exports of the processing industry, so canned foods and so on, by 50 percent. 
Um, these figures were, um, uh, change between the products, of course, wine, for instance, 50% exports, and it so Sounds on. like a very comprehensive po policy framework. Yeah, because framework. we are uh, pursuing quite, quite aggressive um, export promotion policy. Great. No, I'd be curious to see sort of what other lessons we can draw from this and perhaps how the, the interventions that you've implemented might parallel with what's being done in other countries or what might be effective yeah. in other countries as well. Uh, but before we, we go on to come back to speak about that, I, I'm going to turn to Ajmal. Um, and talk a bit more about sort of from the academic perspective. Um, you've done, you've recently put out some new research um, via the Duke Global Value Chain Center um, and you've linked together concepts of economic, social and environmental development. Um, so can you talk to us a little bit more about how those concepts and your research sort of, uh, I guess, encapsulate um, the challenges that are associated with making value chains um, more equitable worldwide and making sure that value doesn't just accumulate um, on the processing end but is also coming back to primary producers. Thank you, that's a very good question. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to first thank ITC for the invitation. Um, I represent Duke University Global Value Chain Center and it's an uh, honor and pleasure to be among this distinguished group of speakers on this panel today. Uh, let me begin uh, by stating that agricultural value chains are not a new phenomenon, and nor is the strategic drive to transition from agriculture to agribusiness. Uh, what's new, however, is the scale of adoption of global value chains as an analytical framework by international development organizations and national governments uh, to understand how global production and trade systems operate uh, and also to identify opportunities for them to upgrade and achieve competitiveness ideally in a way that they combine economic, social and environmental objectives. Also new as our ability to quantify and measure global production and trade in value-added terms, benefiting from the increasing availability of global input-output table statistics uh, through sources such as World Input-Output Database. Uh, so I'll focus uh, on three key takeaways from the recent research that we did. Uh, looking at how distribution of value and its drivers uh, uh, are in uh, global agri-food value chains. The first point uh, or takeaway is that approximately 86% of value is concentrated in pre-farming input uh, and services and also post-farming, processing, brand manufacturing and retail distribution the share of farming is actually the least and has been declining. Second, value distribution between uh, factors of production has been shifting away from lower skilled and mid, uh, mid skilled labor towards capital and high skilled labor. Uh, so these two takeaways kind of have particular policy implications uh, supporting the topic of discussion for today's panel uh, the shift or transition from agriculture to agribusiness where value is concentrated and also the fact that agri-food value chains has become increasingly capital and technology in intensive. So the right sets of technology uh, and the right type of scales are important parameters of competitiveness in international markets. And the next point that I would like to make is that some of the mega trends in agri-food markets over the past decades have actually disadvantaged small and medium enterprises with respect to both of those outcomes. First, extensive consolidation in agri-food markets has actually intensified power asymmetries in value chains. Second, rationalization of supply chains by some of those large firms as to reduce cost and risks of outsourced production as actually often to that disadvantage of small and medium enterprises. And the third point uh, that I would like to make is uh, that erosion of policy institutional support uh, services or support base 
has actually deprived small and medium enterprises of the uh, network of services and infrastructure that make them productive. And this ironically happened and coincided uh, an era where uh, there is rapid technological innovation, there has been growing global integration, and trade and investment policies have increasingly liberalized. Uh, so, what are the conditions and how can we make agricultural value chains on agri-food global markets uh, become more inclusive and sustainable and work uh, to the uh, advantage of small and medium uh, producers? And uh, this is the question that I uh, raise as my concluding point. Uh, let's, uh, let me stop here, and I'd be glad to address this question in the Q&A session. Thank you. Or I might ask it to you in the next round of questions. But um, very interesting findings, and um, clearly, propose, uh, clearly your research uh, puts forward some policy conundrums um, for, for policymakers and also for international organizations to tackle um, going forward, which brings us to Perrin, who is here with us from IFAD, which is an international organization. Um, and I think it's, it's interesting that Ajmal was talking about sort of the need for innovation and also the rapid changes in technology that are now confronting um, the agriculture industry. Um, so in terms of the work that IFAD is doing, um, innovation has always been challenging, particularly for smallholder farmers and for SMEs in this sector. Um, as they try and move towards competitiveness. So what kind of work is IFAD doing to support um, producers in that way? And particularly, how does this impact youth and women? Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great opportunity to be here and share IFAD's experience. Um, you may know, uh, but we've been active uh, for the past uh, 50 years um, across the world. We work in about 100 countries. Uh, most of our work is in Africa. Uh, we currently have a program of work of about 500 million US dollars only in the smallholder agriculture support. And here is what we find. We find that there is a lot of new technology. In fact, there is often, in a number of cases, quite an abundance of new technology. What is not happening is the uptake of that technology to facilitate rural transformation. So we still have today in the fields, in uh, the farms of the small producers in the outback uh, of most countries in sub-Saharan Africa, indeed in Asia and also in parts of Latin America, technologies that have gone way past their use-by dates. Why is that? On the one hand, there is not enough investment to facilitate the uptake of that technology. The second is the organizational capacity of the communities themselves to be prepared to take on that, that new technology. The third, and that's also a worrying evolution, is that a lot of the, of the community members that are best able to take on the new technologies are moving fast away from agriculture. So the younger men and women are running away from the farms. And they are probably the best ones that could be the agents that are best placed to absorb new technologies. And they are running away because it's a vicious circle. They see a back-breaking spade or shovel every day when they wake up. So they run away from that. This is not their future. Why is it that simple machines, basic equipment, irrigation schemes are not finding their way to the smallholders. We are challenged by this. What we are committed to do is provide not only the investments, but the support infrastructure, the community organizations, the mobilizing of the efforts and energies, the right policy environments, last but not least, and importantly so, getting the private sector to fill in that space, because until the private sector takes on these investments, the sustainability and the pace of the transformation will not be to the scale and the speed that we would require for effective development to take place. 
lots of challenges to confront, but I'm sure a lot of innovative work is being done in that space as well. Um, I, I, there are several points I want to come back to on that, but I'm going I'm to go to Dorothy first. Um, because um, you're sort of bringing the International Trade Center, as well as your experience um, working in the government in Zambia um, to bear um, on this discussion. Um, and in your experience, um, what do you think the role of international organizations should be in enabling sustainable agriculture and in enabling especially more sustainable value chains in the agriculture sector? Thank you very much, moderator, and good morning to everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, indeed, a privilege on my part to be amongst the distinguished panel this morning. Um, perhaps I, I, I could start by saying maybe a lot of what I would have said as part of my opening remarks has in one way or another been touched upon by those that have spoken before me. In particular, I think some of the elements that IFAD raises are really ones that we are confronted with as well. But I could also start by perhaps saying the, the context that you set out for us at the beginning is very much one that has been reaffirmed through the experience I have had at the Enhanced Integrated Framework as well as ITC. It is very clear that agriculture remains one of the main priorities that most of the countries have actually conveyed to to us as those that are, that are supporting the process. It is also one that has been reaffirmed in the context of the various research work that has been done. I think the second point I wanted to mention relates to uh, the aspect you raise in relation to agriculture being the, the, the opportunity that is seen to, to be one that can open the possibilities of the attainment of the sustainable development goals through the inclusive nature that it potentially holds. And I think there you have rightly pointed out it's the challenge of how you integrate the small ones, particularly taking into account that these are mostly from a rural dwelling and therefore the ability to comprehend the issues around uh, what would enable them in terms of trying to practically be able to engage in trade and therefore bringing that trade and the, the trade and development nexus closer is something that is really of a challenge and I think this is where being innovative and trying to provide solutions that are practical and applicable in the different circumstances is, is, is what we have to deal with. I think the, the, the other point I would like to make, this is really a sector for countries that are heavily dependent on mining, such as mine, uh, seeing the opportunity to diversify. But it is also one that provides opportunities for the gender dimension, because in most of the countries you find that women are very actively involved in agriculture, and therefore it is one that potentially holds uh, the solution to try and, in part, to bring in that equality, particularly on the aspects of women economic empowerment. Now, the specific areas where I feel that the international organizations can pr play a role, obviously, is primarily to support the objective of the attainment of the aspirations of the different governments in this particular area. But that process has to be demand-driven. And therefore, on the other hand, what one would want to seek is to make sure that we have that ownership assumption giving the indication to us as part, strategic partners that can support this process to be able to respond in a manner that is relevant to the priorities that have been identified. I think the second point linked to that is this customization. Not one size fits all. And I think oftentimes we tend to have solutions that are really good, but perhaps not applicable in the circumstances that we are dealing with, particularly in the sectors in agriculture. And I think whether it's a combination of the solutions or indeed very specific solution tailored towards the small players is something that we need to look at. Third point, 
we need to have timely interventions. And as international organizations, we need to find ways and means of working with the different governments to try and understand the situation, but also understand particularly when a, when a specific intervention is required. There's no point in us going in different times and trying to come up with partial solutions which at the end of the day do not have much of an impact on the ground. The next point is the scale. If we are talking about agriculture, you have to have scale. And here, it links in to the need for us as, as international organizations, but also going beyond us, because really, if we are to create the scale and impact that we are seeking, we have to have strategic partnerships at the country level that have that outreach to areas where perhaps a number of our organizations do not have the ability, neither the resources to reach out to. So having a coordinated um, way of intervening in the different countries is very, very important. Sharing of good practices. I think a lot of good stories are out there. There's no need for us to be reinventing the wheel. I think the focus should be more on customizing that to the specific situation. Joint resource mobilization, because I think this is really a critical element. I think countries have moved from a point where I, I recall in the days of uh, the EIF when we just started, it was more of we don't understand what it is that we have to do, and therefore a lot of needs assessment were done. So in a way, most of the countries know what needs to be done, but it's the specific interventions and the associated resources that are required. And I think here we have a role as international organizations to work with the different partners to see how we can support the resource mobilization efforts. Finally, the innovation. We have to keep going. This is a very demanding um, situation where, as rightly pointed out, from the other parts of the world, when you, again, I come back to the issue of Africa, from the other parts of the world, they've considerably advanced. But at the same time, the need perhaps is even more in those areas where, in, in the most wanting countries, particularly the LDCs. How do we support them in an innovative way, providing integrated solutions that can have the impact? Thank you. Thank you very much, Dorothy. Um, and actually, uh, linking back to the points that you were making about scale and especially about customization, I want to come back to Edmund to speak specifically about your initiatives on the ground. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping that you can talk to us a bit more about specific, you talked a lot about the financing challenges that you faced um, and how you grew your business. But can you talk to us about the nuts and bolts about how you actually work with farmers on the ground? Because that is often the very difficult linkage um, you know, people who are working on one to two acre plots of land, people who don't have a lot of access to finance, capital, um, equipment, or inputs. How did you bring them in to your um, industry and sort of build it up towards being um, more of a value chain that value chain that links to international markets? Great. Um, let me talk a little bit about the value chain of the cocoa industry. Um, the value chain from cocoa bean to the chocolate uh, chocolate bar is about 100 billion. Ghana and Ivory Coast produces about 60% of the world cocoa production. But they make about 6 billion out of the 100 billion. Although they are contributing about 60% of the world produce. This is far too low. And agricultural industrialization needs to improve. Add, adding value to products needs to change and capacity needs to improve in Africa. And what Nate's strategy is, is to add value to cocoa beans before exporting to the international market. Ghana, is, 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 um, we are doing about 25% processing and the government initiative is to do up, up to about 40% and Nate is trying to champion this initiative. For example, we work with um, a small and large cooperative farms like Kwapa Koku, whereby we help them to buy their live crop before they export to the international market. 
by paying premium on their fair trade cocoa beans. By doing that, we're able to help the cocoa farmer to increase their livelihood by at least 25% before they sell or export their raw materials. And just to clarify, um, you're mostly bringing people um, into your value chain once they're already incorporated into some sort of collective. You're not going to farmers individually. Exactly. The Ghana government has got, um, um, is responsible for bringing the cocoa from the hinterlands, then they sell, in turn sell to the processors or export to the international market. Okay, very interesting. Um, and do you have a particular process by which you select which farmers collectives to work with? Yes, we can select um, both um, a, a licensed buying company to be able to work directly with the farms that we are very much interested in. For now, we have a strategic partnership with Kwapa Cocoa, where we buy all their um, light crop cocoa beans and process. And how important was government support to growing your business? Did you feel that policymakers were putting in place regulations that were supportive to you, or was government sometimes an impediment well, the to Ghana, what you're doing. The Ghana government has been very supportive. Um, we have the Ghana Free Zone Board, whereby um, you don't pay taxes for the first 10 years, which helps you to be able to grow your business. Um, the Cocoa Board sells the live crop to the local processing companies at about 5% discount, which helps them to be able to buy more cocoa and process internally. So the government has put policies in place to help processing in-house. In, in Interesting, thank you. That actually sounds like it has some uh, similarities, not, not in the exact details, but in terms of the general outlines of the policies um, that Rufat was outlining that were part of Azerbaijan's um, agricultural reforms. Dorothy brought up the idea of sort of learning about best practices and that we don't need to reinvent the wheel in agriculture. We kind of know what needs to happen. When those policies were being creative, uh, were being created in Azerbaijan, where were you looking for inspiration? Were there other examples that you'd look to and said, this looks like a successful way to grow an agribusiness sector? Uh, yeah, I absolutely agree with you. You don't have to reinvent the wheel when this wheel exists. Um, and this is the way we, we, we actually looked at the, the, the whole issue. Uh, we definitely analyzed the experience of other countries uh, in terms of policy making, in terms of the tactics of how to implement these policies. Um, <clears throat> I can give you an example of our own uh, ASPROMOS, my, my foundation's uh, experience in uh, developing the mechanisms for the export promotion. We looked at different countries starting from um, Australia up to, I don't know, Kazakhstan, um, some European countries, Turkey, um, uh, Costa Rica, and so on and so forth. So we, we, we have searched for the best practices. We've seen what they have done, whether this has worked. By the way, once when we were analyzing these best practices, we were contacting also the businesses in those countries to see whether they use those incentives or mechanisms and how it works. Um, so then we have selected certain small number of uh, mechanisms that would suit as well, but these are very traditional ones that apply almost everywhere, like participation in fairs, trade missions, this type of stuff. Uh, we have approximated them to our local conditions, expanded them. For instance, not many countries pay uh, to, for the businesses when they participate at the uh, trade mission. We pay completely, I don't know, tickets, hotels, and everything. Um, but we also introduced our own based on the needs of our producers. I can give you an example. Uh, the producers, the agricultural, but also agro-processing, those who are doing the, uh, the, the processing food, who are processing foodstuffs, um, the major challenge is to enter into the sales channels in foreign countries. Uh, for instance, retail chains and this type. Uh, we have introduced a mechanism where the government supports producers to enter directly into the retail chains of foreign countries. Because you know, if you are entering the retail chain, there are definitely a lot of costs that are related to this process. And in mo most, most cases, especially small and medium enterprises, they can't bear these costs because they are very high. 
So we take these costs ourselves. Uh, plus, it's not only just entering the uh, supermarket, but you are also about marketing. So you, you have to make visible your product. If we go to, um, I don't know, to Dubai, um, um, it doesn't mean that a customer in Dubai, a potential customer in Dubai, enters the shop to look for Azerbaijani product. Probably they even don't know what Azerbaijan produces. But if you make it visible and attract attention, um, so the customer may once try it, we of course uh, uh, try to make that they become loyal to our products and, so, and stimulate them for that. Uh, and everything is done by, I mean, st um, um, financed and um, to large extent organized by us ourselves. And this is, I, I don't know where, whether this such such mechanism exists in other country. So. Um, um, Definitely, we look at international experience in all of those companies that I've mentioned in my um, um, introduction. Uh, we localize them, basically, but we also look at the specific needs of our businesses, and based on those needs, we identify additional measures. That's why I told during my uh, uh, introduction that always policymakers have to, have to talk to the uh, businesses. You have to be direct, uh, in direct contact with the businesses to understand their needs, to understand the challenges and constraints. Without that sitting in our offices, we won't be able to uh, really identify um, what measure, or what policy, or what tactics would really suit best um, um, the needs of our uh, business communities. Thank you. So the need to learn from our others, but also to customize and to consult in formulating policy. Miklos, I'm going to turn back to you now. Um, and I was hoping that you could talk to us a little bit more from the perspective of building your business. What were the specific challenges that you confronted in setting up an IT business in the agriculture sector? Um, was it difficult to get uh, producers on the ground to accept your technology or to see the need for it? Uh -huh. I will speak just about the barrier what, uh, what we faced in uh, front of the farmers. To understand this, uh, you have to understand the agrovir unique position. These global uh, producers are contacting we, with us because we have very specific and detailed information from the field. Uh, which, from our perspective, no one else has. There are many farm management software around the world. There are many, it was many farm, farm management software in Hungary, but uh, are specific that we have very detailed data, which tractor, which driver, how amount of, what amount of fertilizer went into what type of soil. So we tried to collect the data, and first we expected to our clients to record the data. And as uh, my panelists mentioned before, in agriculture, uh, the aging is a huge problem. They don't like IT. Many of our clients cannot use computer at all. So it was a huge challenge to train them, to teach them, to educate them, to show them uh, how it helps them on, a, on an everyday level. Uh, you ask me for practical examples. Uh, we had one, uh, one farmer, an old guy, who didn't use mouse even before. And we decided there will be a picture of a nice car if he make a document uh, nicely. We did just once, because we decided it's not professional, and it wasn't cars actually, but uh, it helped to them. I just want to say it needs training on a field level, on a farmer level, and it's need training on a country level. When we started to go abroad, we had to start from the scratch because there are farm management software, IT solution, and we had to educate and explain why is our approach is different, why is better, what benefits the farmer can actually have. That sounds like a very challenging environment, though, in which to build a business. I mean you're having to go in and basically teach people how to use computers before they can use your technology. Yes, yeah, sometimes, yeah, we have to. Uh, how, do you, how did you approach that in terms of a business plan and in terms of talking to investors about sort of, you know, who are looking at, you know,
profitability and they want dividends relatively quickly. How do you, do you sell that model to them, knowing that you would have to go in and do that kind of groundwork? Uh, at, at first, it's quite difficult for every new product. It was the early adapters who were keen about the technology. Few of them not even keen about the profit, but they wanted to have higher yield or less. We had clients who wanted to have less greenhouse gases, for example. And we had to show them the benefits they have. But even if they like the product, sometimes it took them years to decide because they faced the challenge. And I think, I hope we find a solution for that. When we went to abroad, we didn't want to take years again to training and teaching, and we realized that smartphones can solve the problem. We don't want the guys to record any data, any data. There is GPS, there is camera, there is an FC reader, quite cheap solution, and in this case, we can spread the best management practice, the best agricultural knowledge, very quickly on farm level, on film level, to each of our clients. Very interesting. Perrin, I'm going to sort of pull from what Miklos just said, though. So you're working a lot of the time in sub-Saharan Africa, as you said, with you know, people who are basically at uh, a subsistence level of farming, trying to sort of bring investment to them, bring innovation to them. A lot of the time, you know, we hear conversations about agriculture in LDCs um, and people talk about sort of mobile phone solutions and technology as sort of, you know, the, the silver bullet, so to speak. At the same time, though, I mean, hearing about how challenging it is for um, Miklos in a country like Hungary, which is quite a bit more developed than a lot of the places you're working, um, to implement his technology. Can this kind of innovation be distributed more equally around the world? Can it be brought to the kinds of communities that you're working with? Or is that just an unbridgeable divide? Thank you very much. Uh, one very famous uh, president in the modern world said, yes, we can. And it is true. Yes, we can. But are we actually taking bold steps to make it happen? And when we do try to make it happen, are we continuing along the necessary other steps to keep it in a sustainable way. So we have seen actually in this current situation, in this day and age, that there are good practices happening in the most remote areas, in the most disadvantaged areas, but is it at scale? And the answer is no. What is necessary to bring it at scale? The next effort is it has to be scaled up or scaled out or really fast-tracked, because some are making the progress and others less so. What are the essential elements to make it happen? One is, you are right, madam, to insist that on the one hand, it needs to be also demand-driven. You cannot just go out with a bunch of mobile phones and, and appropriate applications and say, here you are, use it. It may not be used properly. Same with small tractors. Same with small irrigation schemes. There has to be a bit of the capacity to demand, and when it is demanded, it is supplied. When it is supplied, just like it is happening in the capital cities of Europe, there is an after-sale supply. There is that support infrastructure. There is that continuous ability to take it to the next level, so we need to work on that. The reality, though, is that this is a slow process and it often diminishes the opportunities that these technologies can bring along because agriculture in Africa, in Europe, in Latin America, in Asia is still a very high risk industry. It is still a very high risk business. And we have the obligation, therefore, because agriculture is so central to the well-being of millions of people. It is so central for food security. It is so central for employment. It is so central for food safety. We have therefore the obligation to maximize the opportunities to de-risk the sector. And the sector is increasingly having to confront persistent risks, but also new risks. Climate, the terms of trade, quality dimensions, the markets are de 
demanding more and more higher quality products, the cost competitiveness. So, in short, yes we can, however, there are many, many steps to unfold, to make it happen. It is, it requires a persistent effort. It cannot be done by one and one only, it has to be a broad range of partnerships, including the communities themselves having the drive to make it happen. It requires the public, the private, the research institutions, the, the technology developers to all come together and make it happen. That is not an easy job, actually, making partnerships work. We often talk about it, but it's probably one of the most difficult things to make it happen. Someone told me last night, you can imagine some partnerships at home, how that is a challenge, so you, making it at scale in the most difficult parts of the world is a big challenge, but we've got to work at it. Ajmal, would you agree? I mean, you outlined in your initial um, remarks that there is sort of this growing drift between sort of um, low-tech um, producers that don't have access to capital on one, on one end of the value chain and then at the other end, very high-tech, high-skilled, and I would assume sort of lower um, worker demand, uh, like lower employment demand um, industries at the other end. Are we going to be able to pull those two ends of the, of the scale together to create sort of single value chains? Or is value going to continue to accumulate at the upper end? Uh, it actually depends to begin Doesn't the, it always? the uh, answer. Uh, yes, there are power symmetries in the value chains and they have increased uh, a lot over the past few decades as value chains have become more consolidated. Uh, but to achieve uh, the objectives of economic, social and environmental upgrading and help farmers adopt some of the technologies, there should be a commercial case to that because often when you are changing practices um, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, improving production processes uh, or um, uh, changing your uh, technology, it's not only that you face risk, but you, it's also additional cost uh, to your business. Uh, so often adoption of uh, these standards in the context of private governance that uh, multinational brands often under the pressure of civil society organizations adopted certain standards and certifications that require their first tier suppliers up to even uh, to the farms uh, to meet those requirements, but evidence has shown that they've failed to reach scale. Even today, 10% of global agri-food production are actually in those chains that meet those certification standards. So how to move beyond uh, those constraints? Uh, evidence has shown that there is limits to private governance. There is a role for effective public governance combined with private governance to make those things happen uh, and to customize and to reach scale. Uh, but there is also an important role for international development organizations to work in these governance pro uh, processes, uh, which is often a global public good because these standards are often made in the capitals of consumer countries and then producers in developing countries are required to meet those standards and they don't have a lot of say in terms of what the uh, content of those standards should be. And often uh, each firm or each particular country have their own set of standards. So it's not um, a good idea to um, be cautious about uh, application of chemicals and make sure that there is limited uh, pesticide residue in agricultural food products. Uh, but the challenge arises that if an agri-food or uh, agro-business from a developing country wants to diversify markets and export to North America or Europe or even different countries within Europe, they face totally different sets of standards. And that partly leads also to some sorts of um, captive relationships because of the high investment costs that once you invested in adopting a certain set of standards to a particular market or to a particular firm supply chain, then you're locked into that. So you have to uh, meet the sorts of price and requirements that are set by those firms. 
Uh, uh, so I would like to conclude that yes, first is adoption to make the commercial case for it. There's an effective role for uh, public governance, uh, but there's also an effective, uh, an important role for international development uh, organizations uh, to think about how these governance processes are set up uh, and to make sure that global uh, public goods are delivered in a way that is not costly and risky to producers in developing countries. Thank you. So Dorothy, I'm now going gonna, gonna to punt it over to you. Um, and in terms of some of the points that um, Ajmal was making um, on the need to sort of rebalance sort of policy making to rebalance how standards are made um, in order to allow sort of smaller enterprises to enter these value chains, what it, are organizations like the International Trade Center doing about it? What can you do? Um, thank, thank you very much. Um, I think very valid points being, being raised, but perhaps I, I would start from a point of saying the standards are there and they have to be met. And what we have to deal with is the reality of first and foremost making um, producers understand what the requirements are, but also working with them, trying to find innovative ways of facilitating that. I think for us to uh, perhaps take a stance that I fully appreciate that we would need to continue having the conversations around harmonization, but the reality is that this is a long-term conversation that is not going to yield immediate results. So the issue should be, what is it that we can do in the interim to try and facilitate trade to happen, even for the small, small players? And this is where ITC has been coming in, trying to come up with a number of tools that will create awareness around the requirements of standards. Uh, September this year, we launched a sustainability map, which provides a lot of information in terms of the, the, the standards requirements. On the voluntary side, we've also, within that platform, we have information on rules of origin that are required. We also have a, a, a portion of that platform uh, dedicated to providing the opportunity for the producers to connect, to understand, and be able to do uh, transactions as part of that platform. Uh, these are some of the initial efforts that we, we, we are making, um, but it is a reality that we, we have to deal with. I think alongside that, it, it is one part the standards, but there are other non-tariff measures that actually inhibit trade from happening. Again, a very much an area that ITC is involved in, we are not only doing surveys to identify what those issues are that in, inhibit trade and could actually, if addressed, bring down the cost of doing business. Once we have done the assessments, we have been working with a number of countries to put in place a mechanism that continues to identify these issues as they come up and to be able to find solutions through a comprehensive involvement of um, a consultative mechanism at, at the country level. Um, third, third, third point I wanted to perhaps bring about, which is perhaps uh, slightly linked to the issue of standards I raised, is the aspect of the global, global public goods. Market intelligence, whether it's information or the intelligence part, is really important. Unless you know what you're dealing with, you will not be able to uh, take an appropriate decision or action that is required. So as ITC, we have been very actively involved in ensuring that we keep coming up with innovative tools that support this process. On the information side, we have different um, tools that we provide on procurement and other areas. But on the competitiveness side, yesterday we had uh, the presentation made uh, of the of this MECO report that we produced on an annual basis. Um, there was a particular focus on regional integration yesterday, clearly giving the signal, the possibilities there in agriculture for uh, value chain development, but that opportunity is not being taken, care, uh, taken at full advantage of because the foundation has not been set within the different regions that we were, we were looking at. So these are some of the tools that we, we, we are providing. At the country level, what we are also doing is to give a better perspective, in, uh, a better understanding of what is pertaining. So we will, as a principle, going into a country, 
one take into account all the work that has been undertaken in terms of understanding what the situation is. But in addition to that, we will do a quick needs assessment which will highlight the key issues that have to be addressed. And within that, we then develop a very specific um, roadmap that addresses um, itself to the actions, the accompanying actions that would um, require to be undertaken. Perhaps to, 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 to make a final point in relation to the intervention. No intervention is going to be sustainable unless it's anchored in national institutional structures. You will go in, do what you have to do. As you come out, the whole thing crumbles. So as ITC, it is very much at the fore of what we are doing to make sure that we are fostering trade through sustainable process, both from uh, the intervention perspective, and, but also from an institutional uh, perspective. We have a fully dedicated team that works with different uh, institutions in the countries that are related to trade and investment. And these are entities that we work with. We try to ensure that we strengthen their effectiveness, but also strengthen the, the nature and uh, ability to service those that they are interacting with. We, perhaps it, it gives a sense that we are working with the big institutions within the countries, but our definition of institutional structures is one that filters down even to the cooperative. So if the cooperative is the one that we see being the necessary um, middle, middle, uh, middle entity that we have to work with, to make sure that that intervention is sustainable, but that that intervention is also reaching out to get the level of impact that we are looking, looking for is what we will do. Perhaps I can end here and come back. Thank you very much, Dorothy. So the big takeaway from that is, is it's important to keep s solutions local and to make sure that you're speaking to people on the ground and keeping, keeping tabs on stakeholders. Um, at this time, I am going to take the opportunity to open the panel to the floor um, and to take some questions from all of you out there. So if you could put your hand high in the air, say who you are, where you're from, ask a concise question, um, and if you want to address it to a particular panelist, just let me know, that would be great. Um, let's start with the enthusiastic lady at the front in the wonderful pink coat. Uh, can we get a microphone up here, please? Let me start by thanking the panel. I think I really thought that we covered this subject very well. For us, moving from agriculture to agribusiness is, is what we need to do in Africa. But, and again, when you look at all the food that goes to waste in, 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 in Africa, you see that there is a potential, strong potential for that. But I want to refer particularly to cash crops, um, like cocoa, and this is addressed to the, to the, um, to the presenter from Ghana. We all know that these cash crops are commodities that are bought by different countries and processed and come down to us at prices we cannot afford. So we should not be naive, and that's my question. I mean, how well would those that prefer to buy commodities from us, how well would they take it if we try now to have a mass movement to actually do value addition ourselves? And the second point, how do we ensure that we meet the quality and the tastes that have been well established um, in terms of these products and keep the cost at, at, at a reasonable level, bearing in mind that we also have to import some of the ingredients that we need to transform it. Then I have another question which I'm relates sorry, to... We're gonna, I'm going to have to leave you at two just because we do want to give other okay. people a, a chance to speak, but thank you so much for those questions. Edmund, oh, well. can you take that one on first? Great. Um, Adding value doesn't mean that um, we are moving all the value chain to Africa or to the origin country. Um, for us, we are adding value to the semi-finished product by making cocoa butter, cocoa cake, cocoa powder, which goes into the ingredients of making chocolate. And exporting, let's say, cocoa beans to the international market, we are actually reducing weight by 15%. So that even helps the end user. Since we are also um, ISO 22000 certified, we have the quality certification 
to be able to produce quality products which meets the international standard. So when it comes to quality, if we are able to get certification, it will also help us to be able to meet um, the international standard and produce for the international market. So adding value in-house or in the origin countries doesn't mean that it will not benefit the end user, but rather it becomes a win-win situation for both parties. But uh, as a follow-on to her question, aren't there other um, potential players in the middle of that value chain that stand to lose out somewhat if you are bringing more of that val value to Ghana? Have you encountered some opposition there? Um, let's take um, reprocessing in Ghana. We are forming partnership with um, a third party whereby they will melt the product because we can't sell the solid cocoa butter or cocoa liquor to the international market. So there is a melting station whereby they will melt the product to be to able to deliver to the end user. So in that case, um, there is a paradigm shift whereby we also create other opportunities for the um, end users also. Thanks a lot, Edmund, and thanks for the question. Let's take another one. Um, gentleman over there already has a mic. Thank you very much. Thank you for the panel. Uh, because ITFC's uh, financing portfolio con almost con consists of 40% of its financing portfolios for agriculture. So we do uh, financing for the whole value chain and starting even from the fertilizers until the end when the, when the people export. Also we do the development part which is actually whether it's a B2B or IT or, or other, other, other uh, you know, training for the farmers as I said yesterday in my interventions. The, the question is that uh, I think we cannot leave such a very important topic, especially for member countries in the least developed member countries, without linking that to the food security. I think that it is a very important, very important to really look at the end of the day what solutions we are providing also in, uh, in time where we are having issues with climate change and the sustainability of food security in there. Number two is that now most of the, the, uh, the commodities that we finance, and uh, this is for the international organizations, uh, uh, I think we should, we should really think about the added value for the least developed member countries. We finance the commodities. At the end of the day, they, they, uh, it is imported by other countries. So the real added value is not going really to Africa uh, on, the, on, on all of these strategic commodities like cotton, like, like cashew, like other, other ground nuts. We need to think of this big question how can we have really the added value for the beneficiaries themselves? Because today, if you look at even a simple oil, uh, like the one is now produced in Morocco, no, the, the, the value for the importation is, is so low to the extent that the beneficiary is getting nothing. Actually, the big factories somewhere else are getting all the money. And we have to think of how to link that okay, to our, our really solutions that is uh, now set by, by, the, by the respected panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Perron, can I s turn to you first on the issue of sort of balancing food security with also connecting agricultural businesses to global value chains? Because this is, this is a big issue, of, particularly in view of climate, climate change in sort of, you know, least developed countries that are really on the forefront of that. It is a big issue and I think it's good to bring it out. And, and those that don't pay enough attention to the needs to prepare and plan the food security environment pay a very big price and, and they get into trouble. You know, we all know of the many governments a couple of years ago that hadn't adequately prepared for food secure uh, environments and when the rubber hit the road and there were challenges in having reliable supplies that con in, in reliable quantities the populations went out into the streets and, and this is very destabilizing for any government. So there's a high price to pay for not doing things properly. On the other hand, there is also a lot of experience around that there has been a tendency to overdo. So very large storage plants, very large processing plants that have never met the capacity that have never been able to sustain these high ambitions. 
So a realistic approach combined with a bit of ground truthing is what is necessary, certainly at a time when the population or populations are very concerned about waste of investment resources, waste of food, waste of opportunities, because this opportunity could have been taken up by entrepreneurs, you know, small scale, medium scale. So I think there is a, there's a whole collection of experience here of best practice that could be put to, to good use and avoid these situations. But let me just touch on one point that was also, maybe it's complementary from the point raised by Madam here. There are many, many, many new businesses that are mindful of capturing the value addition at source rather than having it move forward to other countries or indeed other continents. But these face a lot of challenges. What is the business environment like? How long does it take to get your business and, you know, registered and, and meet requirements? What are the enabling environments to facilitate that the entrepreneurial capacity is promoted? You identified the challenges that you went through at the very beginning. You've overcome a lot of them. But imagine the many entrepreneurs today who are still in the same position that you were in probably a decade ago. So there is a lot of lessons there on how to facilitate entrepreneurship, facilitate the enabling environment, build the support infrastructure, ensuring that institutions are there and well placed to provide that continuity of support and at the same time not to, you know, not to demotivate potential entrepreneurs in doing the right thing. So experiences from Tajikistan and others uh, will be very, very helpful in uh, and Azerbaijan to really take home to other parts of the world these positive lessons. Thank you very much. Dorothy, do you have anything else you want to add from the I.O. perspective to, on the issues of food security and also where value is actually, actually falling after, after you push for investments at one end? I think that the, the main elements have already been uh, put forward, but to add that what, what always needs to be remembered is that the, the interventions are not standalones. They should be an integral part of a broader vision. And that vision is one that is compelling in terms of trying to find a specific response to the particular issues that are all linked to a particular objective. I think some of the experience from our side has been that the, 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 the political commitment is very much there to move forward, but how this is translated from, from whether it's from that pronouncement to policy and the implementation is where you perhaps see a bit of a gap. I'll give a, a specific example. We are talking about how we facilitate the smallholders. And we are at the same time saying these are very much in the rural dwelling of most of the countries. Now, if this is the case, we move in to make sure that they produce whatever it is that is being produced. That product has to be moved from where it is to get to the market. Is the infrastructure being appropriately addressed to make sure that it fac it's facilitative of that? And I think these are the issues that that need to be uh, taken into due consideration. And it comes back to my earlier point of the strategic partnerships amongst ourselves as international organization, but also going beyond uh, that at the country level to bring in private sector to be an integral part of this process uh, to ensure that at the end of the day that that is effectively happening. Very quickly, coming back to the aspect that was raised by Ambassador Stevens regarding the solution to value chain. And I, I fully concur with the point that was made that, you know, one, it's not necessarily that all the value addition is going to be in the country, but it's also a reality that these countries have constituencies that they have to respond to and be seen to be doing something that is actually moving in the direction where you have uh, the constituency being hopeful that there is something for them to, to, to benefit from the process. But I would see the window of opportunity being one that is created, particularly in the context of Africa, 
within what is being agreed as part of the regional agreement. And I think there, the frameworks are there. It's the implementation that's facing the challenge. The more we can implement and understand that members, as members of these regional integration processes, it is not always that you have to have a benefit. But at the end of the day, if you can identify a particular niche that gives you some benefit out of this process, what I, I, I perhaps, and perhaps I, this process has, has moved from where, I, where it was by the time that I was back home, is that for many of us sitting around the table, it was more of, yes, I want to be part of the regional agreement, but what is in it for me? And if it's not equating in terms of the sectors, perhaps, you know, having a different, and I would be the first one to say that perhaps that we have moved beyond that, but making sure that practically there is a benefit that will be seen coming to the different um, countries. Um, I, one last point on okay. financing. I do want to be able the to cost, take one more question. Yes. So, on the cost of uh, on the cost of financing, I think this is really what we are grappling with, particularly when when you are dealing with the small ones. They don't have the collateral. They don't have the land ownership, which is normally what is being asked for as, as collateral. And these are the aspects that we have to deal with. No one is going to go and want to borrow at 20, 30 percent interest. That is the reality of what we are dealing with. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, we have time for one more question. I see a hand right there in the middle. Uh, my name is Yomna Sharidi and I'm in the, from Egypt in the olive business. And actually some of the products like olives is a, a global commodity. Uh, and some of the challenges that we have been facing in, in the recent years that the farmers everywhere, in Greece, in Spain, in uh, Brazil, in Argentina, and even here in Hungary, when we talked to some uh, agribusiness people, they said there is a big uh, demand a big challenge of finding the right uh, the workers workers not anymore appealing young workers are not appealing to work in the agriculture or to make the, this industry uh, this uh, profession a value added there is very lack of uh, workers and and it's it's a big problem which is something if you know now which is worth really studying why are there are no workers everywhere if I go into, into, into the, the approach of agriculture is becoming an industry by itself. It's not changing the added value per se. It is making the farmer make more money to be able to help the full chain. Because most of the projects, donor projects, they go and say that they will give the farmers a technology to, to uh, for example, instead of planting tomato, he makes sun-dried tomato. Instead of doing this, this is not the issue. The approach of the donors is different because agriculture, if you supply the raw material in a, in a good quality by itself, not taking the easy ways, is, is a challenge. It's a lot of awareness and education to the farmer. And I don't see any of the programs providing that. They only provide that they think added value is, is by itself to make the farmer richer. It's not the point. If the farmer produces raw material crops which are acceptable to be eaten with the worldwide standards, it's a big plus. Mm. On the other hand, I can see that most of the people Sorry, who are... Sorry, can we, can we it, wrap it, this up? It's the same thing, yeah. but I'm, I'm, I have to continue the question because uh, it's a big challenge because I think it's, it's becoming that some of the people who are in agriculture are not... Uh, are being challenged by all these issues and it's not easy to change the mindset of the farmers by itself or the, the people who are keen on the agro industry. So it's, it's uh, part of the thing is to upgrade the quality of agricultural practices which is the slowest and most challenging thing to do. The farmers are hard, very hard to change and I think the donors should focus on this not just to say add value or add chain by itself. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, so two parts to that question. One, which we touched on a little bit earlier, but I think we should talk about again, is how to get young people involved in and excited about agriculture as a business and as something that they can do as a career throughout their lives. And the second one was, you know, about bringing products up to quality and changing the mindsets of far farmers. Um, who wants to dive in first? Any volunteers, please? probably I'll uh, share our experience. Indeed, this is a challenge in terms of uh, upgrading the skills of the uh, farmers or those who are engaged in the agriculture, but also make it attractive for the uh, younger generation. So 
uh, for more highly skilled uh, people. Um, in our case, we face the same, same problem, but more from another perspective, the lack of the agronomists and this type of highly skilled um, 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 service providers in the field of agriculture. We um, launched a um, program uh, via the sector-specific associations, like we have, for instance, Association of Producers and Exporters of Pomegranate. This is one of the brand products for Azerbaijan. Um, in order to train the farmers in how better to use or what new techniques to use in order to increase the productivity, in order to reduce the risks, um, for instance, of um, um, uh, worsening the product during the collecting of the product from the trees, using appropriate um, um, uh, chemicals or not even chemicals, but also some uh, bio uh, uh, products, uh, bio fertilizers, and so on. So um, you have to channel it through. I mean, it's not possible. We face this the problem because 40 percent of Azerbaijani population active economically active population is engaged in the agriculture. You cannot teach, as a government for instance, every individual uh, a farmer. You won't have time, you don't have enough money for that, you don't have enough um, um, uh, people even to do that. So you have to organize those farmers, you have to unite them and then channel this know-how or knowledge via those um, associations or cooperatives and so on and so forth. So um, it is very important to do this, otherwise at least in Azerbaijan we would fail if we would not uh, do it that way. Because uh, ev every time you have so many new things coming out um, um, uh, in terms of agricultural techniques or technologies and know-how, so it's very difficult. And the farmers who are um, um, who have also the lack of access to the information quite often. Uh, you don't expect them to, um, um, to actually use those um, um, knowledge um, unless you provide them with this knowledge and help them to implement this. Thank you very much. Um, unfortunately, there's a lot more that we could say, but we have run out of time. So I want to take the last two to three minutes, just because we've been talking up here and we've covered a lot of different topics in 90 minutes, to give each panelist a chance to give their one key takeaway that they want to impart um, from this panel um, about what is the biggest priority in terms of moving agriculture to agribusiness worldwide. And I'm going to give you each 20 to 30 seconds to say it, so please keep it succinct. So Perrin, I'm going to ask you to go first. Uh, sustainable, inclusive, and uh, climate-sensitive rural transformation. Very catchy. Edmund. Um, by 2030, Africa is going to produce food and agriculture of approximately one trillion. Are we going to continue to be exporting all our raw materials, or are we going to add value to it? I strongly believe we need to add value to our raw materials and create more revenue into the country and increase the livelihood of the farmers. Thank you, Edmund. Miklos. I could hear there are new technologies that farmers don't use. It happens here in Hungary, and I can hear we need to train every farmer. And I had the feeling that you, you have the impression that IT is something the farmers cannot touch. But IT can take the decision to that level to the farmer that go out, turn left, and fertilize this field. You can spread the knowledge very quickly. They don't need to be expert on everything because IT can take this knowledge to the farmer level. Take that tractor, take that machine, and do that job. And I think IT should be used that way, and it should start now, because how we can hear the IT is advancing so quickly, so much, if a country or a farm left behind, they cannot keep up. It, it will be the gap too big to catch up with it. No farm left behind. That's a good one. Um, Rufat. Yes. Um, I think... Um, think 
globally think big but act small. This would be my motto. Um, think about what is happening as we have discussed right now about the policies, necessary um, um, interventions, but act small according to the needs of individual businesses and um, to be more effective. This is, um, to, my, to my point of view, is, is, is the most effective uh, way to tackle the issues in agriculture. Thank you. Adma. Uh, recognize the potential of uh, or the coexistence of domestic regional markets alongside global markets in the rising urban population and middle class in developing countries in trying to achieve inclusive and sustainable agriculture and agribusiness. Thank you. And finally, Dorothy. And to make that happen, strategic and complementary partnerships are a must to have a successful transition from agriculture to agribusiness. Well, I think that rounds it out very nicely. Um, we're going to wrap up this panel now because we're now the last thing standing between all of you and lunch. I have been told to tell everybody that as soon as we wrap up here, you can all go to lunch. There's a buffet on the second floor and that we will all reconvene here at 1.30 p.m. Um, for further panels. So thank you so much um, to all my panelists for their insight. Thank you to all of you for listening. And thank you to the Hungarian government and to the International Trade Center for having us all here today. Bye.